Welcome to Living Free Today, a ministry of Cornerstone Fellowship in San Lorenzo, California. These podcasts are the weekly sermons of Dr. Michael L. Wilson. If you would open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, we'll be looking at Psalm number 5. This is a Psalm of David, as the title says. It is to be sung, for it is to the choir master, and apparently this one is to be sung with flutes. Last week it was stringed instruments, but whoever put this to music originally felt flutes were good. And this is a prayer. In many ways, all the psalms are a prayer, uh, but this one is specifically a prayer of David. Many commentators have called it a generic prayer. Because in Scripture, it is not tied to any specific event. It is not tied to uh, running away from Absalom or Saul or a sin that he committed or anything like that. Now, in David's mind when he wrote it, I'm sure a particular event triggered it. But now that that has been removed from our memory and removed from Scripture, this becomes a prayer that we can look at, and in looking at a prayer in Scripture, a couple things can happen. One, we can look at the structure, and we can say, oh, here's a, here's a different way to pray. I can pray this structure, or I didn't know you could pray about that, or I've been praying amiss this way, things like that. It can be instructive in prayer, but also if you're stuck, you're, you're kind of bored, you want to pray, you don't know what to pray, hey, you can open up Psalm 5 and you can just read it, read it to God and make it a prayer of your heart. Uh, it is 12 verses and there are only two requests in the whole prayer, in the whole psalm. There's one request for all those people and there's one request for David himself. And if we were to pray this for ourselves, we would have to uh, look at one particular part, which is would have to be modified in how we say it because of the Old Testament, New Testament distinction. And so David starts in, Saul, in verses 1 and 2 saying, Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. In the King James, in the NIV, it says meditation. Give attention to the sound of my cry. And many people look at this and say, David is is showing or talking about three different types of prayers that we have. And this can give us an opportunity to look at three possible ways that we pray. When we pray with words, it means that we know what we're praying about. Perhaps we go into prayer with an idea in mind, a request in mind. We want to be clear to God. And so we pray a specific uh, prayer with words. It's planned out. It is very similar to the prayer I do here on Sunday morning. It is a, a prayer that can cover multiple topics. Our mind is engaged. We are thinking about what we are praying. The second is groanings or meditations. This can come when we are in a difficult situation, perhaps confused, perhaps a tragedy, where we don't really know what to pray. All we can do is throw ourselves at the foot of the cross. All we can do is say, uh, God, help us, help me in that way. And, and this is a type of prayer that is more uh, the base of your emotions. And this can come at any time, depending on what state we're in. And then the third is the crying out to God prayer. And this is the immediate sort of prayer Uh, The other day I was driving on the freeway and there was a truck uh, that wanted my space on the freeway. And so the truck began to move into my lane when I was there. I immediately reacted by getting out of the way and I prayed, God, help me. Okay, that was a crying out prayer. No thought. It was reactionary. No planning. It was, God, I'm bringing you into this situation. Do something. And that's a crying out prayer. They will usually come when there is a time of shock or a time of surprise. And depending how practiced you are in praying, you will either do an expletive and do something for yourself or you'll focus it on God. And so 
people who are practiced in praying will, when the going gets tough, pray while they're reacting. And that is something that we can practice and something that we can get used to. Next he says, My King and my God, for you do I pray. And this is a, an idea of how formal should our prayers be. How, when I am praying, should I address God? And I've, I've, I've heard probably millions of prayers. I've been here and there and heard people pray and, and I pray. And there is a time when I hear a prayer and it just hits my spirit that, man, that's casual. But some people say, you just got to talk to God like he's your friend. Okay, I don't always do that. I don't, I, I tend to picture God on the throne and I'm entering the throne room of heaven by grace and I am praying to God Almighty, my creator and my God, my king. And you will never find David being casual or familiar with God. He doesn't start out the prayer with, hey, Dad, how you doing? But yet I've heard that in a prayer. I've heard people pray that way from the pulpit. And that just kind of hits me. And I'm not going to say God didn't hear that. I think there are different styles of prayer. David is pointing out that who he's praying to is his king, which means he, God is his sovereign. God is his, his uh, authoritative Lord. He is running his life. David is in God's kingdom. But he is also his God, Elohim, God Almighty. He is the God, powerful creator of the universe. And the idea is, if David is going to bring big requests as a king, he wants to have in his mind an idea of a big God. He doesn't want to just have a casual conversation. He is going to deal with heavy subjects. And he wants to make sure that his view, as he's praying, and I think most people have some sort of understanding of God or view of God as they pray, I think it is more successful. The bigger that view is, the better your prayers will be. And then he says, for you do I pray. And this is just a direction. It is not uh, to get God's attention in that way. Uh, we all start our prayers with some sort of address to God. We say, God Almighty, or dear God, or Father in Heaven, or some sort of thing to start it out. God's going to hear your prayer no matter how you start it out. You don't need to get God's attention. And David knows that, and so he is just putting the prayer into perspective, if you will, by saying what he is saying. Then in verse 3, he says, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. And people say, aha, you got to pray in the morning. And I say, aha, I'm not a morning person. This is not a command to pray in the morning. There, I mean, I can produce hundreds of books. Way back, Martin Luther, for example, tried to be a morning person and pray, but he couldn't. One reason, in fact, the reason we have church at the last hour of the day on Sunday is because Martin Luther loved to sleep in, and he felt that if we squeeze it to 11 or 10.45 to noon, that it's still in the morning, and he's still covered, and that's why we do it. But people like John Calvin, you get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and pray for two hours. I can't do it. David could, apparently. David was a morning person. It doesn't matter when you pray. It doesn't matter when you do your quiet time. People will swear up and down that you got to do it in the morning, or God's not going to hear you, you're not going to get the blessing. More power to you if you can do it. But if you do it in the early afternoon, it's still okay. God's still going to hear it. When you do it at the end of the day, some people will, will end their day with a devotion and, and go to sleep with that on their mind. And that starts the next day covered by that. That works too. As long as you do it, as long as you have a time of prayer, a time of quietness before God, 
time of day does not matter. Okay? Probably in my heart of hearts, I wish I could get up at four in the morning and pray for six hours. Not my style, not how God has built me. The second part of this is he says, and I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. And this is the part that we need to perhaps modify if we're going to pray this directly. When David sinned, how he got forgiveness, was he prepared a sacrifice, took it to the temple, and an animal died. That is how David got forgiveness. We do not get forgiveness that way. Our sins are covered on the cross we keep our accounts short or keep the forgiveness flowing, as it were, by 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins. God presents a sin to us. We realize that we have sinned. We confess it. We don't hide it. We don't deny it. We confess it, and God clears it from our account. Okay? It doesn't mean if you do not confess your sins or you miss a bunch of them that you're not saved. You are still saved, but your fellowship with God, your relationship with God, has a wall built up there between it. We need to recognize our sinfulness and confess it before God. And so, what we would do in our quiet time is we would confess our sins. That needs to be a part of our time with God. We need to think over our day or over our week, and where has God where have we obviously sinned and where is God pointing to an attitude or a grudge or something that is also a sin and we need to confess that. And as part of our quiet time, make sure that, as they used to say back in the day, keep your account short. Keep the list of things you have to ask for forgiveness for short so that you're not, you know, I'll do it once a year and I'll spend 10 hours doing it. Now, if you do it daily, it really, really, really helps. And then in 4, 5, and 6, David changes gears, and, and what he's doing is he's not looking at a specific person, but in the idea that he was preparing a sacrifice and, and what he was getting a sacrifice for, because when a person, even a king, would take a sacrifice to the temple, they had to tell the priest what sin this was covering. They had to put the sin on the animal, and that had to be at least a public thing between them and the priest because the priest was going to sacrifice the animal. And, and my guess is, as, as David was thinking about what he has done in, in over the last couple of days and, and how he was as a king, he began to see a contrast between the holiness of God and the evilness of the world. And he says, for you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before you. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful men. Now he's not talking about his sin. He may have in mind a particular person. But he's contrasting in this prayer the difference between a holy, holy God and an evil, evil humanity. And to present facts like this to God in your prayer does not inform God of anything. God knows these things. But it definitely puts our mind in a perspective that if I begin thinking about the sins that I thought about committing if I begin thinking about the sins that were committed against me, the evilness that I see in the world, and I begin to fold that into my prayer, then in my prayer, the holiness of God will become even greater as my sinfulness becomes more and more apparent. And what David is saying is absolutely true, that God being holy, 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 no evil can exist next to him, that he abhors all evil, that God's reaction to evil on earth is always strong, full of rage and wrath. And if you read through Revelation, 
starting in chapter 5 and 6 and on, as they're opening the seals, the, the punishment that is coming to the world because of the world being against God for all of these millennia is going to be great. God is not going to say, ah, it's all right, you didn't mean it. God is going to punish it, and he's going to open the floodgates of his wrath. And for us to understand that in our prayers is a good thing, is to understand who God is versus who the world is. Some time ago, there was a meme going around on the internet, and it said, how much sin can you get away with and still go to heaven? And that is a radical misunderstanding of who God is and what our sin is, that it isn't a scale system, that God isn't counting things, and when you go across a certain number, you are no longer saved. You just do one bad thought, bad word, bad action, and you are lost for all eternity. You do one violation of his law, and you are sent to hell for all of eternity. That is the plan. That is the offer that God made. And so the idea that sin is nothing to God is blasphemous and it is insanity. And there will be, I believe, many people who stand before Jesus on the final day and they will get very quickly an education as to how God views sin and what God does to sin. And so David isn't saying that he, because of his greatness, because he's a king, because he was chosen by God to be a king, that that's why he's getting to heaven. It says in verse 7, But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. Because of God's love, David is saved. Because of God's steadfast, abundant love, David is saved. And we will say John 3.16 with perhaps not even thinking about what it says. But it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his Son, that if you believe you have eternal life, that God's saving action is an act of love. And anybody today who claims to be going to heaven, who claims to be uh, born again and a Christian, is that way because of the steadfast, abundant love of God. There is nothing that we did to earn that love. There is nothing we did to increase that love. There is nothing we did to cause that love that God chose to love David, God chose to love you. And so we come to the, the first request in verse 8. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. And perhaps David is looking at the evilnesses in the world and saying, I don't want to be like that. I don't want them to convince me it's a good idea. I don't want those evil counselors to manipulate me and sway me into doing bad things. And so he's asking God to, uh, to lead him in righteousness and to make his path straight. The make your path straight is an idiom. It's an idea that if my path is straight, I can see a long distance, I can see exactly where I'm going, and it's easy to get there. That's a straight path. A crooked path, a, a corkscrew path, a, one that goes up and down over mountains. I can't see anything. I don't know where I'm going. And that is a, a more difficult life following God. And he's saying, make it easier. Now, is God going to? Well, he might. He does from time to time make our decisions and our choices easier. He doesn't do it all the time to everybody. But it's a good prayer to pray, make my path straight, make the righteousness you want me to do clear and obvious and make the choice easy. 
In this, he does not request, for example, uh, wealth or peace on earth. He requests that he will live a righteous life because he knows in his position it is incumbent upon him to be an example to the people, to be a righteous living person, so that as people look at him, they will see a righteous person. And in the same way, whatever we are involved in, if you have a, a good talk about Jesus, but somebody looks at you and goes, ah, I don't really see it, then it needs some work there. And the work is you need to have a righteous life and a righteous path, and we can definitely pray for that. Then he says, for there's no truth in their mouths. So he's going back to the evil people. Their inmost self is self-destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. The idea that their throat is an open grave needs a little bit of of discussion because that meant something 3,000 years ago different than it means today. If we have an open grave... We'll just trip and fall into it. An open grave is a hole in the ground. That's why we do it, if we have an open grave. Back then, they buried people in the side of mountains. If you remember the resurrection story of Jesus, they went up to it and they walked in. That was an average burial place. Jesus was not buried in any place that was special. It was new, but it was common. Everybody had a tomb like that. You were buried in the sides of mountains, in the sides of cliffs, in between rocks, things like that. You were buried in a place where people could walk into it. And if you go and, or see pictures of Jerusalem graveyards today, there are all these little mounds. People are not buried down, they're buried across. You can walk into, and some of them are slightly below ground, so you walk down, but you walk in. That is how they buried people. And they would take people, and they would wrap them up, and they would lay them on a stone slab in these tombs, and then put a stone against the wall, against the door. And they would come back in a year. And during that year, the person had decomposed. They would then collect the bones and put them in a bone box called an ossuary and stack those in a basement somewhere and then use the tomb again for somebody else. You didn't stay in the tomb that you were buried in, okay, unless you were somebody special like a prophet or a high priest, that sort of thing. And so if you, and we can think of the raising of Lazarus, Lazarus has been dead four days, and Jesus said, roll away the stone. And Mary's response is, it stinks. And that is what this is saying, is that if you have an open grave back in those days, and your speech is like that, your speech stinks, your speech is putrid, it is offensive, and nobody wants to be around it. That people who are against God, who speak lies all the time, their speech is just something that people can't stand, like decomposing flesh. That is what David is saying. He is saying it is so bad that you are repulsed by it. And I think you can think of somebody or some place or some speech you heard or something in which you just say, man, i got to get away from this. This is a nowhere nothing. This is just offensive like nobody's business. And that person is operating with a throat like an open grave. They are spewing death in what they say. But they flatter with their tongues. People like that are manipulative. And David is not saying he is this way, but he's saying that the world is this way and it's trying to pull him along. It wants him to be this way. And the world wants you to be a liar, conniving, con man, con person. They want you to advance your own stuff by any means possible. That is the style of the world. 
And it all has to do in this passage with how you talk and how you present yourself and your innermost motivation with what you're talking about. And then he comes to verse 10, which is the second request. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsel. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. So the first request is that David will walk righteously. And the second request is all those that are against God, may they fall by their own counsel. This type of prayer is called an imprecatory prayer. This is a big seminary word, and it means you're praying judgment on somebody. You are praying for God to smite your enemies. That is an imprecatory prayer. There are a dozen or so of those, these that are the whole psalm is imprecatory. In the psalms where David just rails against the evil people, and ask God to judge them. Uh, I have been told that today we don't do this. This isn't nice to pray judgment. Uh, I have told this church and others that back when, when ISIS was at their height, and they were going from town to town and pulling out Christians and publicly executing them, and electrocuting Christian children, and just trying to destroy by fear the message of Christ, I prayed that the bombs that were being sent would hit their mark, that God would use the U.S. military to wipe them out. And I had people come and say, well, why aren't you praying for their salvation? I said, okay, I'll pray that they get saved right before the bombs hit them. If you are coming against God's people that hard, I have no mercy for you. God can have mercy. God can do whatever he wants. But that made me angry. And I prayed that God would wipe them out. And fortunately, yay God, it's working. ISIS is almost all gone now. And so the prayers of Christians all around the world that God would stop ISIS seems to be working. And that's an imprecatory prayer. It is praying God's righteous judgment on an obvious sin. Now, because you don't like the fact that your neighbor parks kind of on the lawn, you don't pray God's judgment on them. That is not an obvious sin. These people in this psalm are clearly against God in every way. And David is praying God's judgment on them. And then he turns it around and saying, but for us, let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as a shield. So he wants the evil people to, to fail by their own counsel, to to be hoisted on their own petard, as it were, to fail at what they're doing because they are evil. And he wants all righteous people to run into God like he's, a, like he's a castle that you can gain refuge in and that he will be a shield about. And that is the, the back and forth sort of prayer that was on David's mind. It is clearly from his heart. It is di clearly from what was going on, even though we do not know it. One commentator says, Psalm 5 illustrates with clarity the polarity and tension which characterizes certain dimensions of the life of prayer. On the one side there is God, on the other evil human beings. And the thought of the psalmist alternates between these two poles. He begins by asking God to hear him, but recalls that evil persons have no place in God's presence. He turns back to God again, expressing his desire to worship and his need for guidance, but then is reminded of the human evils of the tongue. Eventually, he concludes with confidence, praying for protection and blessing. The prayer is not only for protection 
of the wicked persons, but also a prayer for protection from becoming like them. This is a bold prayer. It is a strong prayer. And it is a prayer that perhaps we can get some ideas that if there is real evil going on in the world, we can pray against it. If there is great good in the world or with certain people, we can pray for it and build it up. And he does not pray just about him and his own situation. This prayer is a worldwide prayer. This prayer is an eternal prayer. And so perhaps you can read it. Perhaps you can pray it to God. As with most psalms, this one was put to music by Chuck Gerard, and this is what he did. Give to my words, O Lord. Consider Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto Thee will I pray, my voice. Stone Fellowship is located at 180 Llewellyn Boulevard, San Lorenzo, California. Our Sunday morning service is at 1045 a.m. Our website is livingfreetoday.org and our phone number is 510-278-2622. May God continue to bless you as you serve your King. God bless you.